Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello and welcome. Joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that influenced him the most on his life journey is teacher, speaker, composer and writer Stephen Gray, who's been involved in spiritual work and psychedelics for 50 years, including more than 20 years as a student and occasional teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. Stephen is the author of Returning to Sacred World, a spiritual toolkit for the emerging reality, and editor of Cannabis and Spirituality, an Explorer's Guide to an Ancient Plant Spirit Ally, and the recently released How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. Stephen Gray, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <clears throat> now, you've said that you've always looked to teachers for help. And since one can't always sit at the feet of the masters, books have often functioned as, as, functioned as your teachers instead. Mm -hmm. I have said that. <laughs> you have said that. Do you want to say more about that? <laughs> oh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I got something in my throat here. Um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> I suppose... Um, I was, um, you know, palpably aware of my need for healing when I was, uh, as I came at, came of age, so to speak, you know, when I was about 18, 19, um, I began to realize that uh, there were aspects of the way that I was living my life, which were not making me happy, that, were, you know, were dysfunctional. Um, and uh, so I was looking, you know, as so many young people do, actually, I was looking for information, for guidance. And so I began reading uh uh, books on spirituality and different things like that uh, around about that age, 18 or 19. Do you remember the first spiritually oriented book that you read? Mm, I'm not quite sure, actually, uh, although an early one would have been, it, it was on the, it was a kind of a hippies coffee table book that a lot of people had when I was that age called Be Here Now by Ram Dass. Mm. Um, that was an inspiration. Frankly, a lot of it came through the music. Uh, the, the Beatles, for example, uh, were really ahead of their time in that sense. They uh, fairly early on went to um, hang out with the uh, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and uh, spiritual themes began to creep into their music as early as 1965 or 1966. So, you know, it was the, the thing is that the spiritual. Um, uh, world was coming uh, like gangbusters in the uh, starting from around the mid 60s and so there were so many different sources oh another early book wouldn't wasn't the first but it was an early influencer was a little book by Alan Watts called um, the book or the book and the subtitle was uh, on the taboo taboo against knowing who you are um, and from there it was just reading a lot of things that I could whatever I could get my hand on hands on you know mm. Well, you started your list, um, you deserve a little slap on the wrist because mm -hmm. people are not supposed to be going over the 10, but I'll forgive you. You started it with not one, but three books. Um, <laughs> and the reason I'll forgive you is because it was the combination of these three, which you say you read in a state of rapt absorption in succession, three times over a five year period, have been the si single biggest influence on your journey. And Absolutely. that was meditation in action by uh, i always hate these names that i have to pr pronounce because i always get them wrong but i'll Chung do it for you Trungpa, you do it for me you, you got it you nailed it Chuggy and Trungpa. I did. okay yeah. good yeah. so what was it about these books that just had you enwrapped 
Sure. And now you could pick, you know, any one of those. The myth of freedom was one of the three. Uh, and if I had to focus on one, that would be an excellent one. The, uh, the other one was cutting through spiritual materialism. And it's kind of the same as uh, very similar, it just goes and, you know, covers some other Buddhist teachings. And then there's a very accessible book that um, I didn't mention by him uh, called uh, Shambhala, the Sacred Path of the Warrior. Uh, well, the short version, I don't know how long we have to talk about each one of these books, but the short version for our purposes here today is that um, uh, I've, I, I just connected with this person through his writing immediately. When I mentioned, you know, when I said the rapt attention factor, uh, you know, I'm not particularly prone to what you might call um, otherworldly kinds of experiences per se, you know. So this one it felt palpably real to me on the third time reading one of those books while I was reading it, as you mentioned in wrapped a state of rapt attention and absorption. Um, I felt a presence in the room and, you know, I know that will sound kind of woo woo to, to some people, but uh, it was so rare. I'd never experienced anything like that. And I immediately sensed it was him, Chugyam Trungpa. Um, and that triggered me to go and join a, a, a local community because up to that point, and this would have to be properly explained in a much longer story that we won't get into today. Uh, there was a lot of um, flaky and even dangerous spiritual naivety going on in the late sixties and early seventies uh, in the West, in North America, et cetera. Um, and I was very suspicious of groups, but after I had that experience, I saw something that I'd been studiously, obviously ignoring for the previous readings, which was it's valuable to go and join a community, to be part of a community that's working on this together. And so I did. And, and I just, you know, the simple answer, so to speak, is, is his teachings are truly brilliant. At, uh, he had a way. First of all, he was uh, he had a deep understanding of this, of, of, of the you know enlightenment teachings, if you will. He was being raised to be the supreme abbot of a group of seven monasteries in eastern Tibet, and that would have been his life's work if it had not been for the invasion of the Chinese, which forced all those people out of there in the late 1950s. And so he found his way to the West and, be, and started communities over here. But not only did he have this, he had this incredibly, I mean, he was, he was raised from the age of three till 19 to, 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 for that, des, you know, that destiny that didn't work out. So he had an, you know, from the highest, most advanced lamas, teachers, gurus in Tibet. So he had this amazing background, but he had a genius for how to communicate in ways that were accessible and understandable by Westerners in English. Um, and so I he just, uh, I connected with his teachings right away. Mm. Yeah. Have you ever felt his presence since? Well, I've been in his presence. Um, <laughs> he only lived until 1987, and I was around him a number of times in different environments. Um, well, <clears throat> uh, I don't know who, you know who your audience is here, but I'd have to lean into psychedelic experiences to answer that question. Because... Lean away. All righty. Um, <laughs> in the early 90s, I did a, a guided psilocybin journey with a, you know, a guide, obviously. Um, and he took the mushrooms as well. And I had been talking a little bit about uh, uh, Trungpa and my connection with him. And he said, I mean, who knows, maybe he was just trying to impress me, but he said, oh, he's here. And he, you know, he wants to let you know that he's paying attention. Um, so I don't know for a fact that he's been around, but um, I certainly have not forgotten. I mean, I, have, I left that community uh, gradually over a 10 year period that ended around about 2000 for a number of reasons, problems that I saw in the community and so on. Um, but his teachings have remained with me. Many of them have remained with me. And I would say he's the single most influential person I've ever encountered, regardless of whether it's in person or through books in my life. Mm, wow. Yeah. Um, just before we move on to book two, I, I will answer the question that you posed earlier. We probably allow about three and a half to four minutes max for each book because sure. we do want to talk about you and your work later. And oh, sure. especially I want to talk about your latest book. Oh, thank psychedelics you. Psychedelics can help save the world. So yeah. let's move on to uh, book number two. Um you know, some more unpronounceable words, um, you know, <laughs> but I, I'm British. I'm used to getting it wrong. Um, uh, the unlikely piece at Kuchumagwik? Close. Kuchumakich. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. 
We always right. put so, the emphasis in the wrong place. <laughs> oh, no worries. That's a difficult word. I, um, I had to hear the author say it himself um, yeah. on a video, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, I just want to preface the remain much of the remainder of these books for you by saying that uh, they might not, obviously, some of them seem like quote unquote spiritual books, but they are. They, some, so some of them come at spirituality in a more indirect way through novels and so on like that. But they're all part of that for me. Yeah. Uh, so I just love this guy. Uh, Martin Prechtel is his name. And uh, uh, my first encounter with him was a book called Secrets of the Talking Jaguar, which is a story of how he um, uh, grew up on a Hopi reservation as half Hopi and half Finnish. Um, and ended up by a series of remarkable you know, synchronicities in a small village in Guatemala that he had actually seen in a series of 11 lucid dreams in detail, like shop fronts and everything. So he, he got out there and then was, was met by um, the uh, sort of famous shaman for the, for the whole region who said, about time you got here, Shorty. Uh, I called for you, you know, because so what he needed was somebody who, what he wanted was somebody who from outside who would understand the teachings but could take them away because he knew the, the paramilitaries and juntas were coming in the 1980s to destroy what remained of the, of the Mayan cultures in that area. So this, this one book, that uh, the, the Unlikely Peace at Kuchimakich, this guy's a, just a fabulous writer and a beautiful storyteller. And um, it's that particular, that title only refers to one small part of the book, which is a um, a, just a beautiful story about this um, massive, um, uh, I it was an earthquake, I guess, that, um, <clears throat> that totally devastated the whole region where he was in Guatemala at the time. And he tells the story about how they were trying to get food to people who were completely tr cut off and trapped and, you know, their, their fields were destroyed, their animals were destroyed, they had nothing. And just the um, incredibly generous and peaceful attitude of the people that they were delivering food to, which completely blew his mind. But he also tells stories, uh, once he came back to the United States, there's this whole thing about corn and the sacredness of corn. And he was, there's a much longer story that should properly be told, you know, in more detail. But the simple version is that he was given some seeds of this sacred corn that they've been growing for thousands of years there. And he smuggled it back into the States, gave away a bunch of it, gave it all away actually and then it kept coming back to him and people would come up with these stories like oh i planted this and it just went nuts and blah blah and so he uses seeds as a metaphor for you know the changing of consciousness mm. so do you know do you remember when you came across that book that well the secrets of the talking jaguar was probably 15 20 years ago but uh, um, uh, the unlikely piece at kuchimakich i just read about two years ago Mm. It's. I think it's from 2014. That book. Mm. Roughly and it doesn't. There. Just so you know, it doesn't really matter whether the books are overtly spiritual or not. It's as yeah. long as it's inspirational, and Good. made an impact on people's journeys. We've had all kinds, from the Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz to, you know, uh, Game of Thrones to just uh -huh. about everything that you can think of. Um, right. So let's move on to number three, which is Narcissus and Goldman. Uh, published in 1930 by Herman Hesse. Yeah, well, I I read uh, pretty much everything that Herman Hesse wrote uh, in my 20s and was deeply influenced and moved by the passion, the the spiritual yearning. You know, his books are about the seeker, uh, uh, basically. And um, I picked out Narcissus and Goldman. The first one I read was Damien, and I just fell in love with that book and went from there to read everything he wrote, uh, pretty much. Um, but Narcissus and Goldman is a wonderful book. Um, it basically it's all again about the search for the self, or the you know for the awakened self, so to speak. But what he does, he does is in, in a sense design, divides two yearnings within one person into two characters in the book. So Narcissus is the um, is the um, uh, ascetic. Uh, he's a, like a monk and a priest and all that kind of thing. And he stays in that uh, environment for his life. But he had uh, through, I forget now um, how he connected with Narcissus or pardon me with Goldmund. Um, but they became fast friends and had many wonderful conversations. But, and Goldman had the same spiritual yearnings, 
but was intent on learning about the world by experience. So he goes off and wanders and has all these experiences. He's very attractive to women, so they fall in love with him. And he has, you know, all kinds of different, exper different experiences. And then they kind of hook up again later and share their, their different paths. There's much disappointment in, in our Goldman's experience in the worldly world, but he brings back learnings to Narcissus. This is the best I remember it. I read this book 40, 50 years ago, and I have not revisited it recently to refresh my memory, but it just deeply influenced me because I have <clears throat> um, strong, uh, you know, pulls in those sort of two different directions as well. I'm a householder. I have a wife. I don't have kids actually, but I taught children for quite a while, taught them music. Um, and, you know, I own a house, I'm a homeowner and things like that. And yet I've also always had this yearning for the, the spiritual world. And when I was in my twenties, I half contemplated going into a monastery because I was so, um, I don't know, I was suffering a lot, but also yearning. Uh, so they, as I say, uh, Hesse in that book and other books, but in that book in particular, he takes the two characters to represent those two sort of yearnings or sides of one's, uh, you know, mind and uh, so on like that. Yeah. Hmm. You know, it's interesting because your list, um, it contains two books uh, that synchronistically I've just had conversations with other people about, oh. um, you know, and they're not necessarily, you know, the most common books that one would expect to turn up uh -huh. you know, within a couple of days e of each other. But the next book, The Ministry for the Future, which is a fairly recently published book by Kim right. Stanley Robinson. I was chatting to a friend about that just three days ago, mm. two days ago, mm. who recommended that I read it. And now, yeah. so well, I th tell, tell me why I should read it. Well, I consider it a very important book, actually. Um, you know, it's ostensibly science fiction. That's the genre that uh, Kim Stanley Robinson has worked in and had some very highly praised novels. But there's always a, a relevant political visionary kind of edge to his work. Um, uh, it's not like just for entertainment in that sense. And this book is very different from anything else he wrote. Um, it, if, if you didn't know, if you just sat down with this book and didn't know anything about it, um, uh, you know, didn't read the back cover or the reviews or anything, you, you might think it's nonfiction. You might think it's just a series of reports because uh, the book is an unusual format. It consists of, I don't know, a hundred or more short chapters of anywhere from a half a page to three pages in multiple different voices. Um, the only connecting narrative um, thread is, uh, I think her name is Mary. She's the the retiring head of the ministry for the future. Um, so it follows her personal story somewhat as well, as well as a guy that she knew. But what it's really about is it takes place about 30 years in the future. It's never specified exactly, but it seems to be around 2050, uh, which is the only reason you would even call it an, a science fiction book. Um, uh, and it, and it just uh, in an incredibly intelligent uh, way um, extrapolates uh, conditions as they exist now, like in particular regarding climate, that's the fa the focal point, um, and takes it to where you could easily imagine things getting in another thirty years. So the two sides of, the, of that, so to speak, are one is that the climate has become much more perilous, much more in certain respects. These kind of heat domes that we had, like here in Vancouver, where we broke records by five, six, seven, eight, nine degrees Celsius, just bang, you know, for three days in a row. And, the, and this whole town burned down because of it. That kind of stuff, they have, it, the book starts with a terrible situation in India where they had one of those and millions of people died. So you sort of see the dark side of this in the early part of the book. But then um, uh, he, he expo uh, uh, postulates a whole bunch of really creative, innovative uh things that happen. So you hear reports from all these people, scientists, politicians, and all these people saying, well, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. And here's the latest law. They've banned commercial air travel, um, fossil fuel sourced commercial air travel by that point. And the only way you can cross the Atlantic other than on a, in a boat uh, is on an airship. Uh, which takes two to three days, but doesn't generate pollution particularly, right? Um, so there's all these wonderful innovations that that um, that basically we should be thinking about. Uh, it's just a it's just a remarkable book. He did a he's just a really intelligent 
thoughtful, caring guy. And he did an immense amount of technical research for this stuff. It doesn't come across as, you know, overly technical. It's still very readable, uh, but I would say important. Barack Obama considered it one of his books of the year, for example. Mm, I, yes, yeah. my friend was saying that some of some of the suggestions that are made in there, as you say, are just what we should be examining mm -hmm. now yeah. ahead of time. Yeah. Book number five, when you read about a book and you hear the words dangerous, wicked, forbidden, mm -hmm. <laughs> as the Daily uh, New York News uh, wrote, and then they said, you bet, pour yourself a bowl of chips and dig in. This book is Fierce Invalids, Home mm. from Hot Climates by Tom Robbins, and that was published in 2000. So what is so dangerous and wicked about this? Well, wicked in a in a in a playful way, in a way, uh, not not truly wicked in the you know serious way. Yeah. Um, so you know, Tom Robbins is another one of those people whose multiple books uh, I loved and, and influenced me, and I picked this one out because it might have been my favorite. Um, Tom Robbins was an advocate for freedom, for like inner freedom, for the free spirit, um, who wasn't bound or you know limited by the, the strictures, restrictions of society and, you know, the, the general hoodwinking that takes place on, you know, for, for many people. So he's an adventurer and he kind of embodies that full range of the free spirit. So he's got his kind of kind and compassionate qualities. He's got his roguish qualities. Um, uh, he, he's just a, a, a really interesting guy. And so was Tom Robbins. I mean, Tom Robbins, uh, before he wrote his books, he would, he only wrote a book about once every five years because he wanted to live life in between. And he would go on sometimes even dangerous adventures like, you know, canoe trips up rivers full of crocodiles and things like that. And so he, he lived the life that he was writing about, not directly. There's nothing really autobiographical in his books, but he, he lived that life of adventure himself. And so um, uh, Switzer, I've forgotten whatever his name was, the main character in the book. He's just like that. He's like a ribald, um, you know, loves to live life to the fullest, uh, you know, in a hedonistic way, but also brilliant and compassionate at the same time. My, there's a, there's a, a little, um, one little event that, that happens in this book that it, to me is just the one, the one thing that's always stayed with me and I tell other people about sometimes Switzer, I think his name is, goes to visit a friend who has an apartment or whatever. And as soon as you step in the door, there's a parrot sitting on a stand in there called Sailor. And uh, to every single person who comes into that room, Sailor the parrot says, people of the world, relax. <laughs> Which I think would be a kind of a Tom Robbins motto. Relax, enjoy life. Stop taking yourself so seriously. That's what, you know, Chogim Trungpa said, stop justifying yourself and live, just live. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll move on with the last five of Stephen's 10 best spiritual books. Stay tuned. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion, and there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. 
Through our produced shows, OM Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an OM Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on OM Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive OM Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. OM Times, open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Stephen Gray, our next book, book six, is one of your top three or four books of the past 20 years or so. The book is Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm, Beyond the Doors of Perception into the Dreaming of Earth by Stephen Harrod Booner. Why is it one of your top three or four? Well, I love this guy too. Um, and he has a number of other books. He's a, he's a, he has a very deep understanding of medicinal plants, for one thing. Um, and, you know, this is into, for some people, uh, into the woo-woo category again. In one of his other books, he talks about how he had um, uh, an uh, intractable uh, chronic condition that no doctor had been able to figure out. And he was telling a friend about this. And the friend said, well, you know, the, the native people around here, Native Americans have um, a, a plant that is supposed to work with that. And so he took it and it worked. This thing that no medical you know, expert could deal with at all for years. So that changed his life. And, he, and so he, what he started to do was he started to actually sit down and meditate beside plants that he wanted to get to know. Maybe he read a bit about their taxonomy and that sort of thing first, so he knew a little bit about them. But then he actually sat for hours and hours and hours and silenced his mind. This is the essential aspect of all of this, is that, and, and it's essential for our future too, is that we need to quiet our minds enough to be able to um, vibrate with the intelligences that are around us. They're moving in different vibrational patterns that we need to uh, clear space to connect with. He did that. And um, so these plants started to communicate to him. Uh, like, I do this. I'm a, an antibiotic for trees. We help keep trees healthy. You know, that kind of thing. Um, this book, Plant Intelligence and the Imaginal Realm, he talks a lot about the intelligence in nature. It, the title actually is, doesn't even quite encompass at all. He talks a lot about creativity, talks about that kind of sensi sensitivity that I'm talking about, talks about the just amazing intelligence in different aspects of nature. Like, I'll give you just one example really quickly. There's a slime mold. I think it's considered a singular, a single cell thing. The well, blob. scientists... Yes, the scientists love to play with this stuff and like, how do these things, you know, do what they do, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, they, they knew what the food source for this thing was um, and they, they put it on the opposite side of, a, of a, la a maze, I guess you'd call it. And then they put the, you know, the, the blob, the, the little cellular thing, um, a slime mold thing on the other side. The slime mold had no problem negotiating through this maze that a human would have struggled with, right? to get to its food source. So they took it one step further. They took some food and put it over on this part and then some other food and put it over on this part, both on opposite sides. The slime mold split into two, sent one half of itself one way, the other the other way, got the food and then hooked up again. This is something without a brain. That in itself tells you the intelligence that's in every aspect of life. So Stephen Heron Buner is brilliant and important on all this in my view. Yeah, I was just talking about the blob the other day, um, recorded an interview with Eric von Daniken and his latest book, um, uh, Evolution is Wrong. And he was talking about that blob. Mm. I mean, you know, it it knows what to avoid. It knows you mm -hmm. know, where it wants to go. And nobody knows where it came from. 
And you don't need what we call a brain. There's a lot of work on uh, mushroom mycelia these days showing the absolute intelligence of what's going on under the ground, which is under every footstep that you take. Um, mycelia are the mo possibly the most important organism on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> um, they connect everything and they adapt. That's what Stephen Herod Buner calls intelligence is the ability to respond to and adapt and change to changing circumstances. And so from that point of view, any plant, insect, animal, bird that can uh, successfully manage and uh, navigate changes in its environment uh, is intelligent. You know, intelligence is knowing what you need to know for your circumstances. So actually, we might just be the stupidest, you know, species on the planet because we're at the moment not doing enough to uh, make sure that the species survives. Yeah. Well, there's a lot yeah. of attention lately on cordyceps. Um, all of these different TV programs mm -hmm. and books about them taking over humanity. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in when you get this stuff, you know, hitting hitting people's minds, yeah. we need to listen. We really mm -hmm. need to listen. Absolutely. Yeah. So book seven, The Essential Rumi, translations of Coleman Barks with John Moyne. Uh, this particular version, I think, was published in 1995. And of course, Rumi comes up again and again in people's Of opinion. course. Well, I, you know, he's just wonderful, of course. He's brilliant. Um, and he just puts it in these succinct ways, oftentimes in these little quatrains. And he just, uh, he clearly understood, you know, the, the unconditional nature of reality. It, it just comes through with wonderful passion and, and lovely little poetic ways of putting it, you know. Um, for example, he's... He understands, as I was mentioning, this idea of being able to clear our minds enough and calm ourselves enough to be able to connect with intelligence you know, you know, in everything, essentially. Uh, Rumi talks about silence a lot. Uh, he has a, a wonderful little uh, one, well, it might be part of a quatrain, but it's, I think it might just stand alone. It's silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. And then he has many others like that, uh, similar to that, like, um, don't let uh, your thoughts cover the moon of your heart. Let go of thinking to enter in, you know. Um, so he's been just inspiring and beautiful to read and valuable because it's teachings. They're poems, but they're teachings. Mm, yeah. Um, book eight, I was interested to see this one because I thought that title rings a bell and I checked through my uh you know Amazon list on my mm -hmm. iPad and I realize it's been sitting there for ages waiting <laughs> for me to read it and having yeah. read your description and a little bit more about it I think it's yeah. going to be my next read but the book nice. is Empire of the Summer Moon Kwana, oh, yeah. Kwana yep. Parker and the Rise and Fall of the Comanches the most powerful Indian tribe in American history by S.C. Gwynn. Right. So I don't know if I would say that one has particularly influenced me, um, but I've, um, I've always been very interested in uh, Native American studies and Native American uh, cosmologies. Uh, I, I was a frequent participant for 12 years in the Native American church uh, peyote prayer ceremonies, for example. Um, there's just something about the earth wisdom of Native people that has always struck me, going back to even when I was 18 or 19 years old. Now, this book isn't about that. I just found it an amazing uh, story and, uh, and, and a read. Uh, the author uh, did a lot of primary research, of which there's a lot. Uh, this all happened in Texas in that general area. Uh, and it's, it, to me, it's all just fascinating. Um, like there's still, you know, newspaper articles from the time. And there were a lot of books written about this because it was, it was just, I mean, it was, it's incredible tragedy for one thing, but also this, these Comanches were these amazing people for another thing. And Quanta Parker was the chief of these people from a time he was about 20 or so. I don't remember the exact age. He was just a fearless and brilliant guy. And they held off this massive, um, you know, U U.S. Calgary uh, invasion of their of their territory for decades um, with a small number of people, just because they were so stealthy and intelligent. They they were horse people. Um, they were actually before they got the horse, which came up from Mexico. Um, they were the the most primitive of the tribes in the whole region. They didn't have 
arts or, you know, weaving or they didn't, they weren't farmers particularly. They were raiders. They were warriors. But once they got their hands on the horse, um, the, the, the Calvary had people uh, um, from like the horse uh, nations of uh, Northern Europe, like Russia and places like that. And when they saw the Comanche on these horses, they were flabbergasted. Um, so quite remarkable. Remarkable. Uh, but there's another thread with Kwana Parker himself. Um, he was just one of these guys that every time something happened, he came up floating, you know, he came up standing upright because when he finally, when they'd finally just brought it down to like a small handful of, of the Comanche remaining in like the late 1860s, the writing was clearly on the wall. And he finally just walked his people into fort, into the fort and surrendered. But then he became honored to, among the white people. He had a big mansion. He knew the president. And he co-founded the Native American church uh, because he wanted the peyote religion to survive. And he knew that the, or the peyote practices that they'd been going on for hundreds of years, he knew the only way that they would survive would be if they um, incorporated as a religion because those Americans, they loved religion, you know? So they managed to get it incorporated and that's how it survived. It's legal for Native Americans now to use peyote, a, a psychoactive psychedelic that normally Americans would go, oh, oh we can't have that, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, his mother was an incredible woman, Cynthia Ann Parker. She was kidnapped by Comanches at the age of six, grew mm. to love her captors, and she became infamous as the white squaw who refused to return. But mm -hmm. she was captured by the Texas Rangers in 1860. But, you know, just in, amazing. And they say that he was the, the greatest chief of the Comanche, never defeated, mm -hmm. and his guerrilla wars in the Texas panhandle, made him mm -hmm. a legend. Wow. 40 years, 40 years managing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and you also see in that book, which, you know, I kind of knew already, the incredible um, misleading nonsense myth-making that um, the Americans have made of their, you know, conquest of the West. And the, and the uh, Texas Rangers, for example, um, they're like, uh, you know, Mr. Prigozhin's Wagner group. They're a bunch of exiles, criminals, and ne'er-do-wells with brutal mentalities. And that's that That was who a lot of the cavalry were, but especially the Texas Rangers um, that get um, got immortalized in movies, TV shows, and books, and all that, you know, as these mm. heroes, you know, um, mm. like the Lone Ranger, you know, the old TV show. He was supposed to be a Texas Ranger, you know, but these people were terrible people, terrible. And they treated the native people with them abject you know terrible you know disrespect absolutely mm -hmm. um it's a it's 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 one of the world's greatest tragedies a whole nation i mean a whole massive country well canada and the u.s um not, not to mention that this stuff happened all over the world but in particular in the united states there were i don't know a couple of thousand uh, tribes or nations there actually nations living there um, and every single one of them was destroyed every single one of them it breaks my heart still I'm almost yeah. crying just to say it again you know yeah 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 well that's a book worth reading mm. yeah it's a beautifully written book too it's a it's an it's a good read it's you know it's not hard to read so book yeah. number nine Mm -hmm. Sand Talk, How Indigenous mm. Thinking Can Save the World by Tyson Junker Porter, who is an Australian Aboriginal academic and woodcarver. And he's got an amazing story to tell as well. Yeah, well, um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, he has a deep understanding. He, he lived with, he is indigenous, um, Aboriginal, and he, he spent much of his life with those people, lived around them, learned from the elders, and they have a remarkable worldview that's very important for um, the rest of us to hear about, uh, which is, again, similar to um, many indigenous peoples at their best, you know, in the truest, best parts of their experience, um, is this connection to the earth, the embeddedness in the earth, the the understanding that nature is alive, the world is alive, um, that, you know, spirit is real, um, and that's who we are. And we have to live in that sort of humble, interbedded, uh, or interwoven, embedded relationship with all. Um, so Tyson talks about that in that book. And also, um, he has a chapter in the book that you mentioned that I've 
um, put together recently, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. It's a lovely chapter on those kind of themes. Um, he talks about how, for example, and I think this is really important for us going forward, that um, uh, Aboriginal society was what he calls heterarchical, which is as opposed to hierarchical. And he said uh, that um, uh, authority is acknowledged and respected for obvious reasons, because it's learned and earned, right? But he said the authority figures don't have power, you know, in the political sense um, in that culture. So there's no centralized control in Aboriginal society. Uh, and um, I, I could have mentioned an 11th book because I'm just reading it now called The Dawn of Everything that, that um, upends a lot of conventional understanding of what societies were like historically, uh, that in fact there were many heterarchical, heterarchical type non um, elitist, you know, non-king oriented, etc. societies. But it's this um, individual empowerment and understanding that needs to be uh, brought into our understanding as we undergo a consciousness transformation for the generations to come. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's, uh, like many of the books that you're talking about here, he too is saying that, you know, we really need to learn to see from a natural native perspective, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. as, as with the plants, as with yeah. nature. Yeah. 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 And by the way, just briefly, I know we got to move on to the last book, but um, uh, the reason he's in how psychedelics can help save the world is because there's a couple of comments about that. And they're very um, different from what a lot of people would say. He thinks that people should use those if they use them at all, very sparingly. He said, if you don't, he said he took a he took a major journey with a, a South American cactus called San Pedro about 15 years ago, and he said I got so much information out of that that I never needed to do it again. And if you don't get that kind of information, you feel like you have to go back every you know week or two to blow your mind. He says you're not doing it right. Interesting. I'm going so to come it's a back. Ca cautionary kind of tales there too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to revisit that what you said there afterwards um, when we mm. talk about this book. Um, number 10, this is the second synchronicity because mm. I was having a dialogue on email with Barbara Hang Clow about this book, who's just really on wow. her 10 best. Because she's said, still around. <laughs> she's still around. And um, a friend had recommended this book to me a couple of years ago, and I started to read it and didn't get very far. Um, mm. And I said, you know, I can't say that I was compelled. And mm. she said, oh, please keep reading. Please keep reading. The book is not in his image, Gnostic mm. Vision, Sacred Ecology and the Future of Belief by John Lamb Lash. I think this one was published in 2006. Tell me why it's on your list and give me another good reason why I should go and revisit this book. Well, um, I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in in his themes because I'm particularly interested in those themes, you know. Um, uh, the whole idea is that, uh, you know, this is a gross simplicity, you know. It's a long, in-depth book. This guy, the, the research this fellow did is just beyond belief. I don't know how he got any sleep while he was doing this because he, he studied so many primary original sources. I believe he learned a fair amount of Aramaic so that he could read the Gnostic Gospels. So his, I would say, you know, again, this is, um, you know, almost embarrassingly oversimplifying things, but, uh, you know, in our short amount of time to talk about it, I would say that his central thesis, um, which is one I've been familiar with for quite some time, um, but he takes it to new levels in certain respects, uh, because there actually is a lot of remaining literature from 2,000 years ago, believe it or not. Um, his central thesis is essentially... Um, that there were many um, heterarchical, so to speak, uh, more or less, quote unquote, free uh, cultures, societies, and so on. And there were all these mystery schools existing in the time prior to the, what we call now the common era, or the uh, AD, you know, after the death of Jesus, um, leading up to that time. And for the next two or three, four hundred years, where it was gradually being increasingly crushed and suppressed and erased from the pages of history, there were these um, uh, goddess-based oftentimes, like this really famous place called Eleusis, which was a temple in, in ancient Greece, a couple of hours donkey ride or whatever out of Athens. 2,000 years, this annual ceremony 
uh, happened or program happened that involved a psychoactive sacrament. We, we don't know quite what it is. We go by the pottery records primarily. But all the, all the great thinkers, artists, intellectuals, and influencers of Athens went there. So the foundations of Western thought, uh, Western philosophical thought, um, are sourced to a large degree in this Eleusis ceremony, which involved taking a psychedelic sacrament, which opened these people up to an unconditioned reality. Um, <clears throat> so basically what happened was the controllers, you could call them, basically shut down this evolution. So in a sense, and Philip K. Dick, by the way, is another person we could talk about um, who's envisioned this stuff in his downloads from the muse, so to speak, that um, around about the time of Jesus, it had been going on for some time prior to that, continued on, well, actually has continued on ever since, a shutdown of genuine spirituality uh, because it's a threat to the controllers, to the egomaniacs, you might say, that are always trying to control because they're actually trying to control themselves, because they're actually terrified that they live in a vast universe that they can't control and don't know the meaning of, they ex they project their need for control outward onto the world. And because they're the kind of people that can find that kind of uh, secular power or religious power through the Holy Roman Church, et cetera, or, or you know, whatever, um, governments and so on, they, they destroyed these teachings and these lifestyles, uh, the Gnostic, uh, Gospels were rediscovered um, in around 19, the late 1940s, still extant from almost 2,000 years ago, validated by, you know, all the researchers, you know, that tested the paper and the ink and the type of the language and the carbon dating and all this. Um, and they were what remains of these teachings, which were crushed by the what uh, are sometimes called the orthodox uh, at the time. Um, so it's a really central theme in our lives. It's important for us as a species because what we're about now is trying to come back from that crushing and trying to rediscover our free souls and um, you know all that implies, which is remarkable. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Indeed. Now you may have had. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a bit dense. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, you, 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 you know, you kind of ran up against a wall with that one. And at a certain point, to be fair and honest about it, you know, once you get up to about page 300 or so, it starts to seem kind of repetitive. You almost sense that he has a little bit too much of an axe to grind on some of this stuff. Um, mm. But I have to honor him for his uh, incredible research and intelligence. Um, it's really about what it says in the title, you know, sacred ecology and the, the you know, the, the, new belief or new um, realization really yeah mm. yeah yeah well i have to read so many books that if it doesn't mm -hmm. grab me early on you know yep. then i'm off to the next one um yeah. sadly but you know most of the books do grab me um yeah. well that's your 10 best list let's talk about you now i specifically want to talk about how psychedelics can help save the world um this is uh really fascinating book and um you said something earlier about um uh the gentleman in australia uh, tyson young caporta yes tyson yes. and um and you also said something about uh another one of the authors who uh, or somebody who said that you have one experience and you you know if you learn everything there you shouldn't need more that was, was also tyson people. That was Tyson. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've commented on that, and that, that's a valid comment, but mm -hmm. in your book, you've yes. got um, a chapter by Chris Bache, mm -hmm. and I had a conversation with Chris um, oh, two or wow, three weeks lovely. ago, and mm. I am going to interview him soon because his book really did blow my mind, mm. and, you know, I've never come across the kinds of information, um, the experiences that he had but he didn't just have one he had what was it 73 mm -hmm. something like that 73, 73 over over a 20 year period yeah yeah but you know there's another argument for that because look at where he went look absolutely at what he yeah, so I wouldn't, um, uh, you know, uh, Tyson's uh, cautionary notes wouldn't reply to somebody like him. In fact, it wasn't, in a sense, Chris guiding that anymore. It was like, once he got in there, for example, 
he had to take a six year break somewhere in the middle there for a number of reasons, family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when he came back and did the next one after that six year hiatus, the, the, the teachings continued exactly like almost like the next sentence. Okay, Chris, you're back. Now we're going to tell you this following from what we just told you the last time you were with us six years ago. Right. Um, so he's in a different category, you know, here, here might be a useful, um, little, um, I don't know, schematic, uh, metaphor kind of, um, Jamie Wheel, who's also in the book and is also quite brilliant, uh, spoke at our conference a couple of years ago. And uh, he said, I'm offering this as a general kind of idea, like don't take it too literally. But he said, this is maybe what makes sense. Um, If you take like 100% of the people, so to speak, um, then at one end, 10% of those people are the kind of people who should never take a psychedelic because they're just too fragile, mental illness, just overly sensitive, whatever, not overly, just super sensitive. Um, You know, they're just not right for these things, or they're just too locked in to, you know, their belief system that they're not amenable to change. Um, And at the other end, perhaps 10% of the people are the serious explorers that, you know, like Chris Bates, that, you know, they're following a course of instruction that, they didn't design it was taking them you know and so it's like he had to go back you know it wasn't like oh i need another big explosion of excitement no no he found it was actually really difficult for chris and he said he wouldn't do it again the same way it was so hard on him like yeah. one of them i think he took like because it's, it's like you're you know you're being hit by a bolt of lightning and then it's not just one bolt it's just staying with you for hours And he actually had to learn to be able to handle that at increasing levels of intensity. But one of them, I think he said, it took him like a year or two just physically to kind of recuperate from one of them. So this is really intense, deep work. Um, And Chris was the man for it. I wouldn't do it. And he said he wouldn't do it like that again. He wouldn't recommend other people do it like that again. But uh, in my view, it was incredibly worth it because of what he brought back. And he has an amazing ability to articulate it as well. And an incredibly kind heart. He walks the talk. I know him fairly well. We're friends. Um, uh, He's spoken at our conference three times, actually. Um, uh, So... Uh, yes. Oh, so, and then the 80% in the middle, um, of those two ends, Chris, or Jamie suggested, maybe they only do it three or do a psychedelic three or four times in their lives to mark special occasions, like the birth of their first child or, you know, a wedding or, you know, some extremely valuable imp- or important, you know, occasions that stick out from everything else you know, honor those occasions by going into a deeper realm, connecting with a truer, more, I don't know, heartfelt, uh, you know, spiritual place or something like that. Yeah. Um, Mm. So, yeah. So that uh, perhaps it's the psychonauts in the, in the sort of the 10% category that are, um, are going to learn. There's a, there's a book, by the way, um, it's called Antipodes of the Mind by Benny Shannon. Um, he, he, he is, or was, uh, involved in a, um, syncretic religion called the Santo Daimi that uses ayahuasca for their central sacrament. And what Benny says in that book is that, that, um, working with ayahuasca is like going to university. Um, you get a lesson, you get some insights, and then you have to apply them to your daily life. And if you do that, properly if you really go and do your homework you know like you go and have your guitar lesson the teacher says you know now go home and practice those scales you do that i did i say i give that analogy because that's exactly what i did i had a teacher and he was always impressed that i would do the homework and i come back oh now we can go further so you come back to the you do another ayahuasca session in a, a week or two or three or four or a couple of months or whatever and the medicine recognizes oh you have put some of these lessons into practice you've been diligent so now we can show you this and so he said you just it builds that way so there's that way of working with these as way as well um yeah which is really the way that chris seemed to i mean clearly there was an intelligence that was guiding him and you know one of the things that um you know validated it for me was the fact that when he would go back after these long breaks the journey continued where it was and he would he never entered it you know, to have a trip, he entered it Uh-oh. with the intention of exploring consciousness. Absolutely. He, in a sense, sacrificed himself because it was difficult. And, you know, he said, uh, 
I think every journey um, had two parts. And the first two hours were sometimes in, I believe this is his actual words, exquisitely yeah. painful because yeah. he had to let go of everything that he identified as Chris Beige and even die to the species ego, identifying as a human in that sense. Yeah. But because he was able to stay present with all that, he broke out into the what he sometimes calls the vast intelligence of the universe. And then they started to teach him. Yeah. 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 It, it well worth reading. The book is called yeah. LSD and the mind of the universe. And I, uh, I'm listening to it on audible and um, mm. it's most extraordinary book I think I've ever read. And I've yeah. read a lot. Yeah. So yeah. tell me more about how psychedelics can help save the world. You know, uh, what was the motivation behind this? And what's what I suppose all the chapters are fascinating in their own right. But do you have a favorite? Uh, well, I suppose that's a little bit like, you know, if the contributors were listening, they go, oh, I'm not one of your favorites. You're like, <laughs> you're like your children, you know, like yeah. you wouldn't say you're my favorite, you know, and have the others know about it. Um, but yes, I do have some kind of favorites and Chris Bache would definitely be one of them. And there's and I put his chapter, you know, right after the introduction, basically, because uh, for that, because he has the big picture in that sense. Yeah. What he talks about is that especially for the last, I don't know, third or so of that 20 year period, I think it was, um, he started to receive more and more messages with increasing clarity or confidence that we are going through a, as a species, a death and rebirth cycle. The death part of it is likely to be very difficult for the species for the next, who knows, they didn't give a timeline. Um, Dwayne Elgin in the book also talks about perhaps the next five, six decades of difficulty that if we do all the right things, the best that we can might start to produce what he calls a mature planetary civilization. Chris doesn't give any timelines. He just sees that we're in for a difficult time, but that it had to happen. This is central to the whole book and you know, to your question about it, um, that it, it needed to happen. And that's a long story, but there's a whole bunch of reasons, development of climate, 8 billion people on the planet, uh, hundred or thousands of years of spiritual disconnection, et cetera, et cetera. And, and who knows, just like a ripening of a child growing up, uh, you know, that yeah. we have reached that stage where it's time to break out of the cocoon, out of the chrysalis. Um, and we have to now because otherwise the planet is not going to survive very well for life. You know, the planet itself will be fine, as everybody likes to say, or people often like to say, you know, the planet will survive. But we want the, the, the life project on this planet uh, to continue. You know, um, it's too beautiful. It's too incredible. It's too brilliant. It's too wonderful to, you know, to, to destroy everything that's been learned all this time. So that's what Chris is on about, and 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 he's just wonderful with all that. He's so so um, articulate and eloquent. Tyson would be another one uh, that I really love um, for the reasons that I mentioned before. Um, just you know, sharing this worldview. This this his Sam Talk book. The subtitle is "How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World." Kind of similar to the title of uh, the, of our book here. Um, uh, <clears throat> And uh, so, yeah, he just has some really interesting things to say, really valuable things to say about the living. You know, for example, I'll just give you one little example. Um, uh, Ayers Rock, I think it's been renamed. It's this considered, it's this, you, you, you see it in pictures. It's like this red plateau rock kind of thing. Um, it's considered quite a sacred spot, I believe, by the Aboriginal people there. Um, and people have taken, uh, Tyson tells stories about how people have taken rocks from there to have at their home. And those rocks were so, so energized that they bring them back or they say, how can I get rid of this rock? I can't have it in my house. Right. Mm. So he talks about, basically he says, everything has spirit. Everything has intelligence, which is again, what Stephen Herod Buhner is, was talking about. Everything has intelligence. And if you're, um, and it's a long stretch from where most of us are, including myself, I think, you know, on the real level of being able to sort of have living, actual communication telepathically or whatever back and forth. It's a long way where, where you know, from where 99.9% of us are. But it's also important that we develop our, our abilities in that direction, 
you know, that we learn how to quiet our minds, learn how to calm our minds. Silence is the language of God, right? Don't let the thoughts cover the moon of your heart, your sensitivity, et cetera, Rumi, and so on. Um, it's, it, that is almost like the great learning curve for us now, is how to tune in to um, the messages and the intelligence that are coming at us, you know, that are, com that are there for us to connect to. And spirit, in, you know, guidance and teachings, I think, are like that. that you know, my, my view of all that is that, um, that uh, you know, there are, like the teachers that taught uh, Chris Bache, that there are teachers that uh, everywhere available to us in not incorporated form, you know, not embodied, yeah. that are available to us, but we're so thick that we that they can't get through. So they'll come through any way they can. And that's where the psychedelics can be incredibly valuable because they open up those channels. Um, they're not the only means to do that, of course, but they are um, have immense potential that way at a crucial moment in history. You know, it's like we need to shock the monkey now. There's no time to waste. So we need all the tools that are available to us and the psychedelics are there's a whole line of discussion that needs to happen about how to do them and how to safely and effectively do them but when they're done properly they have the potential for the right people to open up those channels and it's real it's not like a distortion into some hallucinogenic realms it's yeah. it's realms of reality and teachings that are necessary for us Mm, absolutely, I agree. And I think everything in our external world is, is showing us this. Uh, mm -hmm. The astrology is showing us this, that now mm. is the time for this to happen. Mm -hmm. So how long has the book been out? Uh, I believe it was published, uh, the date was the November 29th of 2022, just last year. So it's only two months now. Mm. Yeah. 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 Worth reading. Um, Thank you. And you've also, uh, you um, organize conferences you mm -hmm. organized the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in 2022. Are you going to do another one this year? Uh, yes, and this will be our 12th, actually. And I've been involved pretty much since the beginning, the first year only marginally. But since then, um, I've had essentially the same job every year, which is to kind of envision what the overall thing should look like and to connect, find speakers and so on. And then I always have a partner who does more I don't know, the more prosaic, more, you know, kind of business oriented side of all that, the ticketing, the social media and that sort of thing does a lot of that, leaving me to focus more on, you know, the kind of big picture of it. So uh, yeah, that's, that's partly why I did this book, because I already knew a lot of these people, 14 of the contributors to the book have spoken at this conference. Mm. And yes, we are going to do another one. And it'll be November 3rd to 5th in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. But it will also be live streamed for people in far flung locales uh, that can't make it to Vancouver. Um, but it's a beautiful conference. It really is. Uh, and that's just not just a sales pitch. You know, um, we create an, an atmosphere there that becomes increasingly powerful as the weekend three days goes on. We call it like the conference with a ceremonial feel. There's no breakout rooms. We keep, you know, we have everything happening in one room. Uh, the room seats about 600 people. Um, we've sold out a couple of times in recent years. And, uh, um, and we even have a cannabis meditation ceremony for all those who want to stick around on Saturday evening, which tends to jump the level of tuned inness on Sunday as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the, the uh, website for that, by the way, is spiritplantmedicine.com. Spiritplantmedicine.com. It's hard for people to keep those words in the right order. They end up going plant spirit medicine, medicine, yeah. plant spirit, yeah. <laughs> spirit plant medicine. <laughs> And my website is stephengrayvision.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-G-R-A-Y. And I've got a bunch of other things on uh, under those names, Stephen Gray Vision, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, stuff like that. Mm. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's ever-growing library of recommendations. I love building this archive for the public and uh, every time we get new editions, it always makes my heart sing. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for doing that and thank you for doing it with me in particular as well. Oh, yeah. you're welcome. You're welcome. Good luck with the book. Thank you. Now, are we going gonna to talk again more specifically about the book in May or is this covering yes, it from your point? No, of no, yeah. no. We're going to talk about it more specifically. 
for oh, sure. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, I, I'm really pleased to meet you, Sandy. Um, thank you for this uh, and um, look forward to our next chat. Me too. Okay, so once again, for more information about Stephen Gray, his books, Events and Vision Mission, visit stephengrayvision.com and not plant, spirit plant medicine. <laughs> yes, com. Did I get it right? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 best interview for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me and thank you to Stephen Gray. <laughs>